Morning. We've reached the conclusion of a, a really successful legislative session where DFL leadership accomplished a tremendous amount for the improvement of Minnesota, as will become apparent in the following months and even years. I want to commend uh, Speaker Thiessen, Majority Leader Bach, for their incredible work and their uh, top aides, uh, Senator Steven and Representative Murphy. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how they stayed awake, much less functional, over the last uh, three days, and I'm sure that same occurred to you as well, but they were magnificent and pulled everything together, ended on time with a platform that, you know, fills, fulfills what we said we would do in the last election, what I said I would do in the 2010 election. We increased taxes, uh, revenues progressively. Um, most of it comes, about half of it, it comes from the raising the fourth tier to 2% 2, 2 on the wealthiest 2% of Minnesotans. That's a, a progressive tax increase, and we use that money uh, along with the, the rest of a $2.2 .2 billion increase to cover the deficit. That's $627 million to uh, increase our commitment to education from early childhood all the way through post-secondary. That's uh, $735 million, uh, $400 million in property tax relief, $90 million in jobs and economic development. So those four categories alone are 1.85 billion of the 2.2 billion. Most of the revenues we raise and raise progressively are going to things that are gonna benefit middle-class Minnesotans. Better education system, more jobs, better jobs. The investments that we're making in Mayo Clinic, 3M, uh, Mall of America, and a couple of other uh, companies, expansions, is just what government should be doing and just what the Republicans refuse to acknowledge government should be doing. If we hadn't stepped in, the DFL legislature and, and I hadn't stepped in, some of these projects would not be happening in Minnesota. But they are because uh, we believe in government, we believe in a positive role for government, we believe in government that works on behalf of the people and we've uh, come through with that this session. Well, first, thank you. Uh, the press corps put some long hours in also and we don't uh, often acknowledge the important role that you play in communicating what happens here to the public. Bill, I read your story this morning. Uh, as classic Bill Salisbury uh, fashion, very accurate. Bill, thank you uh, for, for your work. My Star Tribune comes to the Capitol, so I don't get to read that one until I get here. So, uh, but, uh, What I feel really good about, no, no gimmicks, no borrowing, and <clears throat> we're leaving to the next legislature after the 2014 election no crisis to manage, a balanced budget for the next biennium. And that has not been the case over the last decade. Uh, since the 2003, the class of 2002 came in, uh, they've been every budget cycle coming in managing a deficit, managing a crisis, managing a crisis. And it's very, very difficult to make good decisions about the future and the kind of investments that are going to move our state forward is if the first thing you have to do is get your arms around a deficit and another crisis. And we have reset the clock in Minnesota, put us on a stable a budget path so that the next legislature is going to be able to continue to follow up on this one's work and invest in the things that are important to move our state forward. And I'm very, very proud to have been part of it. Um, well, I think this is, uh, this is a legislative session where we really turn the corner uh, on Minnesota's future. Um, you know, we came in after the 20... 12 elections uh, with a different responsibility than we've had in a, in a long time, a responsibility to lead for our state uh, and to govern well, and I think we, we fulfilled those, those promises. Uh, you know, we, uh, we talked a lot about middle class families, about the middle class economy, and I think this session is a, is a session where we absolutely delivered on those promises, uh, making sure that people have the opportunity to succeed from the very, very earliest years. Uh, history making uh, changes in early childhood. You know, we talked about that for a de so the decade since I've been here actually making those investments. This year we made those investments and it's gonna change uh, thousands of kids' lives all across the state. Uh, investment in all day, every day kindergarten for the first time in this state, another historic change. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, putting money back into higher education for the first, to higher for the first time in a decade uh, and freezing tuitions for two years and again, 
uh, making sure that Minnesota uh, middle class families have this chance to succeed. And you know, I think uh, Jean Pulowski, Chair Pulowski, is absolutely right uh, that tuition is just another tax. Uh, and so Republicans uh, have been raising taxes on Minnesota families for a decade now. Uh, we've reversed that trend. I also think it's important, uh, as, as uh, Senator Bach mentioned, that we did finally get past the partisan gridlock and uh, balance our budget without gimmicks uh, in a fair and honest way. And that is going to be a lasting legacy. We're going to be able to come back next year and the year after and start laying the foundations for even uh, a better Minnesota and a better expansion of Minnesota, a better, um, a better future for, for, Minnesota, uh, for Minnesota families uh, because we finally have that stability in place, that bedrock, that foundation that's going to make a significant difference. You know, as the Republicans fly around the state today, if that's in fact what they're doing, I'm not sure, um, they're going to say we overreached. But the reality is uh, they've been saying that since the night after the election. They've been setting up this narrative, or trying to set up this narrative, uh, since the night after the election. Um, the reality is to that, my response to that is to say for the last decade, the state has underperformed. Uh, and so it may look like overreach, but it's only because uh, you're judging it against a decade of underperformance. We really, this uh, legislative session is going to make a real impact uh, on the lives uh, of Minnesotans all across the state, and, and I really am, am proud of that. And just to reiterate what we've been talking about from the very beginning of session, this was an education session. We wanted it to be an education session, and it turned out to be that. Uh, we wanted to focus on property tax relief for middle, uh, middle class Minnesota families. We delivered on that. We wanted to invest in job creation uh, all across the state, and I mean that this, this jobs package that uh, that Governor Dayton and Senator Bach and, uh, and, this, and the Senators and the House of Representatives insisted on is going to make a difference in getting good uh, paying middle, uh, jobs all across the state of Minnesota. Uh, we are going to deliver on that. And for the first time again in a decade, uh, tuitions are not going to go up uh, for middle class families at our state uh, colleges and universities. And the nice thing about this, uh, being able to stand up in front of you today, is to be able to say all this uh, and not have it feel like spin. This is reality. These are things that we actually did. Uh, I'm really proud that we can stand up here and not have to, to put some kind of uh, media spin on the accomplishments we, we made these, this year, because these are real. These are going to be long lasting, and they're going to set, a, set us up for a better Minnesota for, for a long time to come. Thanks. Good morning. I, uh, I, I simply want to say thank you to Minnesotans. Uh, last. Uh, last summer and fall, as we traveled the state, and we did, and talked with Minnesotans and really listened to Minnesotans, you could hear uh, a real sense of frustration from them in the fact that they saw session after session a legislature that couldn't accomplish what they said so plainly they hoped we would do, which was to get our work done, to focus on education, to, re to reduce property taxes, and to really balance the budget for real. And they sent a legislature that had that intention. And I can't say enough about my colleagues in the House, both the Democrats and the Republicans, but especially uh, those first termers that came in in this last cycle because they uh, were really singularly focused on delivering for Minnesota. And they worked very hard, uh, and we worked very hard to accomplish that goal for Minnesota. And for the first time since I have served in the legislature, uh, we did what we said we were going to do. And I think Minnesotans should be pleased. Thank you. <coughs> I'm battling a cold here, so I'll try to get through this without coffee. First, I'd like to thank Majority Leader Bach. He had a very clear vision for our Senate caucus and uh, led us very well and ably throughout the legislative session. Uh, our partners in the House have been uh, wonderful to work with, and I think uh, we've been ultimately led by Governor of Minnesota, Mark Dayton, who had a very clear vision for how to uh, help bring Minnesota to a better place at the end of this legislative session. And I think that we have seen progress this, this session. I was thinking about this morning some of the real tangible results that I can explain to my neighbors and friends about what happened. And these were some of the things I came up with. First, <clears throat> my neighbors won't pay $2,600 for all day, every day kindergarten, uh, not starting this fall, but the next fall. Uh, that's real money that will be back in people's pockets and it will help achieve better educational outcomes for Minnesota children. The second thing is our babysitter won't see a tuition hike at the University of Minnesota after she enrolls there as a freshman uh, this fall. 
And I know that's important to her because just last weekend she was uh, talking to me about some of the different scholarships she was trying to apply for and how she was worried about how expensive uh, it is to go to our public, un our, even our public universities. And finally, the property tax rebates or the property tax credits. Cottage Grove will see has said that uh, they'll save over two hundred thousand dollars alone on the um, not having to pay sales tax on their purchases. So there are real deliverable results that we'll see from this legislative session that we look forward to continuing to talk to Minnesotans about. I'd also just finally like to thank our uh, Republican colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Although we did have sharp disagreements, there was a lot that we did agree on. Uh, and there, I think we made progress uh, in areas like election reform and, and other areas of the state budget that, um, that we can thank uh, them for their participation in that. Finally, I just like, I've had been blessed with a tremendous staff here in the governor's office. They've worked around the clock for some time now, and I know the Senate and House staffs and the nonpartisan staffs have done the same. So to everybody who makes this place work, I want to thank them. Glad to respond to questions. You always think that the Republicans were good to work with that type of thing. They say they weren't involved in the negotiations that ended up with the deals that you cut here. Why weren't they involved? Well, I think they were, they were as much involved as the DFLers leadership was two years ago, where we sat in here and negotiated the entire budget and tax uh, poli policies and numbers. So, uh, you know, they were involved in the, in the bonding as they needed to be, but I, I, I can't speak to the dynamics of every previous legislative session, but it seems to me that's, that's the norm. That's what happens in Washington. The majority has the majority, and they act accordingly. doesn't mean that there isn't debate. 17 hours of debate on one bill, lots of different points of view, votes, uh, roll call votes on different amendments, the like, and you know, they vo were voted down. So I mean, that's the way democracy is supposed to work. So Governor, how did one party government work this session? I think, we're, I think it worked extraordinarily well for Minnesotans. As Senator Stephen just said, th those are tangible results. Those are real changes in people's lives for the better that will take effect in the next uh, year or two. These projects of Mayo Clinic in, in Rochester, you know, uh, again, the Republicans wouldn't pass a bonding bill that had all these economic development projects. The Mayos of these small towns, Faustin and St. Cloud, Mankato, not so small, but those, those are the equivalent projects. And, they, and they, they just turn them all down. They don't believe there's any role for government in positive economic development. And they're wrong as Mayo proves, as the 3M proves, as the Mall of America prove, as Baxter and these other projects prove, as we'll prove with the uh, money from the Minnesota Investment Fund and the uh, jobs of in, uh, tax incentives, we're gonna you know, incentivize businesses all over the state to expand and create more jobs. And we're gonna do it in partnership with them. And that's something that um, is gonna create better jobs for Minnesotans, more jobs for Minnesotans, and that they'll see the results of in the next couple of years. Well, I don't think it's any mystery that we're working on trying to come up with a bonding bill that could uh, pass the, the state house. And uh, I'm pleased to say that we did uh, uh, get one passed that includes not just the capital. The capital is very important, but I think just passing something for the capital um, doesn't do justice to this broad scope of what, what bonding should be. Uh, so we also included um, the veterans' homes and some flood relief mitigation and some other items. Uh, so, you know, that's what we were working on. Um, and uh, it was the, the piece that allowed us to, to finish, up the, finish up the session. In that regard, why did you decide to include those particular projects in the final spared down, stripped down, stripped down bonding bill and not other projects that were similarly urgent in the minds of some legislators? I would have liked to pass an $800 million bonding bill, but you know, you, you, you deal with the reality that you're confronted with. What was the guideline that brought those particular projects to the floor? It's what could get 81 votes on the floor. Was it tougher to deal with Republicans or Senator Bach on the bond bill? <laughs> Republicans. <laughs> uh, Governor, uh, what's the most significant thing you wanted to see happen this session that did not? Same thing for Peter Thiessen and Senator Bach. 
Oh, I'd have to, you know, frankly, I'd have to go back and look at my list either in 2010 or not, but I'd rather focus on what did happen. The fourth tier, which I campaigned on, which for two years the Republicans wouldn't look at, as a result of which we borrowed $1.5 billion uh, from our schools and from our future last year to make up for that difference. Uh, all day kindergarten was part of my campaign in 2010. Early childhood is coming to the fore. The increasing funding for education. Uh, I just think you know the, the accomplishments far away, and I'd have to think about anything that uh, didn't happen. I'm sure there's something somewhere, but and that's the way the process is supposed to work as well. I don't get all I want. Nobody does. No one's supposed to. Well, I think uh, I think budget-wise, I'm pretty proud of the priorities that we set. I think they reflect. Uh, Minnesota's values. On the policy side, and you know, I, I think um, both the speaker and I laid out at the start of the session that we were going to deal with this budget first, and then uh, once with those budget bills had passed the floor, deal with other policy issues. And the one I feel bad about is we never, we just kind of ran out of time to get an agreement with the House on, the, on raising the minimum wage. And uh, so we have an open conference committee report there, and I, I do hope and, and I plan to encourage uh, my uh, Senate conferees to engage uh, the business community and the labor community in a conversation about uh, what is the, the level that we can raise the minimum wage to. And I do believe we're going to come back next session and do that. What level can we do that to and, and, and you know, not jeopardize somebody's hours or jeopardize somebody's job and find a balance uh, where people can put more money in their pocket to support their families and at the same time uh, not jeopardize uh, uh, the business that they work for. So, well, I would say, uh, I would just say that question, the minimum wage, too. Uh, that was a that was a shame that that wasn't able to get done and get done at a level that could actually support Minnesota families. And I think that's a huge disappointment uh, for 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 those folks. Uh, I was also say the other thing that we're going to have to come back and do. I don't think it's something that was uh, ready and on the table right now. But we, we do have a discussion to be had uh, over the next couple of years about uh, investments in our infrastructure, in particular our transportation infrastructure. Uh, and I think that that's going to be something uh, that we need to engage Minnesotans on uh, in, a, in a very meaningful way over the next couple of years. I thought of something. <laughs> the House, I'm sorry, I read the House's $800 million bonding bill didn't pass because, again, that would have put thousands of, of Minnesotans to work this summer on projects that would benefit the entire state. Instead, they'll be drawing on employment. These projects, will be, some of which have been languishing for years, are going to languish again. And the Veterans Home, for example, you know, the Republicans agreed to put in 19 million. I proposed the whole 51 million. Now that means that we'll have to go to the federal government, which has, I think it's one-eighth of what the money they have for this year's projects of this time that they had uh, a year ago or two years ago. Chances are pretty slim that we're going to get that money. We're going to try. Even if we do, it'll be a delay of another year. And if we don't, we'll have to come back next year and go try the bonding route again. And because once again, you know, the Republicans wouldn't step up to the plate and wouldn't do what, what I asked with the Veterans Affairs Commissioner Shelato and veterans groups all over the area have said is essential, their number one priority. And you know, it's, it's just, they just turned their back on everybody. Senator Bond, you said that this budget puts state on a more stable path. But you're going for more than half the revenue on income taxes, which are the primary fault to source of revenue. Uh, how, how can you be assured that that will be a stable source? Well, I mean, the trend line is uh, we're continuing to climb out of a very, very difficult recession. Uh, so the economy, I believe, is going to continue to get better, which means our income tax collections are going to continue to get better. So I do think over the next couple of bienniums, we're going to be fine. Uh, we're going to stay in structural balance. The challenge long term is uh, still uh, uh, income tax revenue and corporate tax revenue are very volatile. And the next downturn, you know, we, we could end up with challenges uh, again. Uh, uh, but uh, sales tax reform is really hard, really hard, because there are winners and losers and, and uh, governors going back to Governor Perpich uh, tried to put sales tax reform on the table and, and this governor tried also and, and uh, just ran into too much resistance. So it, it's something that I'm uh, going to stay engaged in, but we did, do a, we, we did do an amount of that. And, and really, don't underestimate the, the sales tax exemption for cities and counties. I mean, when I, when I was elected in 1994, that was one of the first things I heard about when I got 
to the state office building. Do you know we put sales tax on cities and counties and they have to raise their, raise their property taxes to pay the state the sales tax? And I thought, what? Really? Well, that doesn't make any sense. And every year that I have been here, somebody has introduced a bill and there have been clone bills to take that sales tax off of cities and counties. And this year we accomplished that. That is a significant accomplishment of this session. And the same is true for the upfront exemption on capital equipment. Every year since I came here, bills have been introduced and said, why in the world are we collecting sales tax from businesses? They have to go out and borrow money to buy the equipment, and then they apply for a refund, and some of them don't apply because they don't have enough accounting staff, and they apply for a refund, and six months later, and we pay them their sales tax back. And it doesn't make any sense. But we were never, ever, in all my years here, be able to find a legislative solution where people were willing to commit the money to actually make the exemption up front. That is a significant sales tax reform proposal. Now, it was done under the context of uh, a, a larger sales tax umbrella. There is some sales tax reform uh, in the bill, not as much as we would have liked, but, but the, the money that we did raise in that sales tax article allowed us to do those significant, those two significant sales tax reforms. On that point, there was a lot of jockeying in the last hours and last days over this warehousing tax provision. Do you expect that will actually take effect in April 2014, or do you think that that is subject to uh, repeal next year's session? Well, I mean, the, the reason that we delayed it uh, was I think we need to figure out what, what potentially some of the unintended consequences might be. Uh, and I think we'll learn more about that uh, uh, over the coming months. And, but, but like any large reforms, and you know, this isn't a grand scale sales tax reform, but it is some pretty significant reforms in, the, in, in there, uh, they come with some clinkers in them. And uh, you know that, that may be problematic, and I know someone's probably going to ask about, well, gee, well, how come you're taxing uh, farm machinery repairs? Well, that ended up, frankly, kind of being a little glitch where the language was supposed to come out and everybody was tired here, uh, you know, hasn't slept for three days. And so we got one little clinker in there. But like in, like in any major piece of legislation, I mean, every one I've ever been involved in, you have to come back the next year and make some corrections to make sure that what you had intended really happened. So there will be some revisiting of the sales tax provisions next year as we learn more about what the potential implications might be, but that's not unlike any other uh, significant reforms that the legislature does. And to follow up on that, do you expect next year for any tax bills to be cor just corrections, or do you expect some more tax reform in a non-budget year? Well, uh, I guess I haven't, I, I'm still kind of trying to digest everything that we've done, but what I do expect is we're not going to have to come back here and raise new revenue next year because we have a balanced budget. So I don't expect a tax bill that's going to raise revenue next year. I think James point out on that subject, you know, in the last uh, few years we paid off 1.9, in the last year, 1.9 billion of the 2.75 billion that was owed to the schools from what it accumulated before. So the surplus, that was all generated by the surpluses due to our improving economy. If we hadn't owed that money, that money could have all gone forward. We, we wouldn't need to be talking about a tax uh, raise increase on anybody for next, the next two years. But we didn't have that, that uh, opportunity. We had to make up for the, pay off that debt. We still owe $854 million more of that. And we had to make up for a $627 million deficit. So our, our, we were put seriously in a hole before we even got started. One more question. The last question on this, Tim. Uh, remember the speaker addressed the overreach issue. Do you feel that there's going to be any political repercussions to what's happened in this legislative session? I, I said when people asked me last fall what would happen if we had a DFL legislature and a DFL governor, I said one word, progress. And that's what we've brought about in the last five months. Progress for education in Minnesota, progress for fair property taxes, pro progress for more progressive uh, income tax to make our taxes overall less regressive, progress in terms of jobs now and for the future. I mean, I'm proud of the progress we made. Uh, you can characterize that however you want, but I, I consider it to be good, good news for Minnesota. What's the next step on transportation? You didn't get anything done. We need to go out and talk to Minnesotans about understanding what the true infrastructure needs. I think everybody here at the Capitol understands that we do have significant uh, investments we need to make to keep our transportation infrastructure 
uh, both transit and roads and bridges, uh, both up to date and expanding to keep our roads safe, to keep our commerce moving. Uh, but that's a conversation we need to have with Minnesotans, and I think it's one we will have over the next year or two. Thank you.